We are going to be covering conducting the fluoroscopic examination um, from your uh, state syllabus. And some objectives that I've written for you are here. Make sure you read them, understand what we're talking about here. First thing we're going to go into is your milliamperage, so your MA. So as you know, is the measurement of your tube current. So it's the in, um, intensity of the beam is directly proportional to the milliamperage used. So in fluoroscopy, we typically use 0.5 to 5 MA. Um, that's the range. So normal fluoro is 1 to 3 MA. So if the state is asking you what is the range used, the MA range used for uh, fluoroscopy, it's 0.5 to 5, but we usually are within the 1 to 3 MA range doing studies. So it is a measure um, of the quantity of x-rays used. So if the MA is dropped from 5 MA to 3 MA, there's about a 40% reduction in the initial dose rate. So that's pretty good. Um, with cassette loaded spot films, when you're doing fluoro, the MA is greater than 100. So just so you know, um, there's always a caveat that states that um, the MA goes higher when we're re using recording devices. So increasing dose rate at the imperphosphor will increase with the tube current, so it gives us a brighter image, but it also increases the patient dose and the operator dose, so we don't like to do that. Next is the kilovoltage, so KVP. It's a measure of the tube potential, so it's the maximum or peak value in kilovolts. It's the quality of the x-rays, so it's the penetra penetrating ability of the beam. So when we talk about KV, it is the electrical potential um, difference in voltage by factors of 1,000. So kilovolts peak refers to the maximum or crest values in kilovolts. So when we're talking about fluoro and x-ray, we're usually talking about KVP. High quality fluoroscopic is Fluoroscopic examinations is dependent on the selection of KVP, so there's a maximum differential absorption by the tissue. A high KVP is wanted to reduce patient dose, so what that does when the KVP goes up, it drops the MA. So as we know, MA is what the dose is. So the differential absorption is better with the lower KVP, um, but the dose is higher because it kicks up the MA. Subject contrast is decreased with increasing KVP. Uh, there's a decrease in skin dose, but an increase in organ dose. So what that means is um, the energy is strong enough to get through the skin, but it's deposited in the organs. So um, we talk about with higher KVP that we have a lower skin dose, but yet the organ dose is higher. So the radiation dose rate at the imperphosphal will increase with the increased KVP. So the increased output from the x-ray tube and um, greater penetrability of the beam of the power of the x-ray beam through the patient. Collimation, just so you know, it's required by law, and this is one of the most important actions that is referred to in your syllabus, so make sure that you don't get this wrong. It must be adjusted so the unexposed border of a fluoroscopic screen or input phosphor on the II is visible when positioned 14 inches above the tabletop and collimators are fully opened. So with automatic collimating devices, some of the devices that we have when you raise and lower the II, it'll adjust automatically. It'll collimate for you. So those automatic collimating devices should have an, an exposed border visible at all heights above the table. So the radiation dose rate at the II is almost independent of the beam size. Image will not be brighter with a larger beam size, but the tissue being exposed is increased. So your image isn't brighter if you open it up or close it. So your scatter is increased with the larger beam size. So the image quality is actually improved with the reduction of the beam size, as we've talked about before. So the reduction of scatter to the input phosphor is the goal here. Integral dose. So the total energy absorbed um, from the beam by the patient is called integral dose. So this is a product of the mass of tissue and the dose which it receives. It's measured as the gram rad, so that's new. So you multiply the rad times the gram. And here's an example, and it comes all together once you see this example. A 10 gram block of tissue is given an absorbed dose of three rads. Then the integral dose is three rads times 10 grams is 30 gram rads. So do you, you just multiply how much tissue got irradiated with how much um, dose. 
So how many rats? So a block of uh, 10 gram of tissue got irradiated with three rads. You multiply the two and that's how you get your gram rad. Make sure you label it properly. Filtration. Um, materials placed in the primary beam to absorb low, low energy x-rays. So x-rays that cannot penetrate the patient, so they're long wave or soft x-rays. They have no useful information. Um, I find that interesting because it says no useful information. When we talk about photoelectric absorption, they do actually give us useful information. So I want you to think only skin dose with this, okay? So really, really soft x-rays, so um, not photoelectric. So made up of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum or equivalent material. So the x-ray tubes operating at 125 to 150 kVp must have 3 millimeters of aluminum equivalent. So filtration reduces dose but it also reduces scatter uh, radiation and improves image quality. Total filtration. So that's inherent filtration, uh, inherent filters plus added filters. So the inherent filters include the x-ray tube housing, so the glass envelope, the uh, windows, and the added filters are sheets of metal, usually aluminum, placed in the primary beam. So total filtration, uh, permanent, total filtration permanently in the useful beam at normally high voltage may not be less than 0.25 aluminum equivalent for fluoro. So, and they're talking about ranges between 80 and 120 kilovolts. Total filtration includes the tabletop, the patient cradle, and other materials positioned between the x-ray tube and the tabletop. That's why I put permanently in caps there because there's also um, other things that will help attenuate um, some of those low energy, so some of the filtration. So the half value layer requires three millimeters of aluminum or equivalent. Your half value layer, so that's talking about the thickness of absorbing material necessary to reduce the x-ray intensity to half its original value. So it's used uh, with the quality of the x-rays. So the concept here that they want you to look at is shielding. So the lead material of choice um, to attenuate x-rays for protection. So we're looking at the half value layer with the lead. It's to reduce 100, here's an example, reduce 100 millirads per minute radiation dose rate to 25 millirads per minute of radiation dose rate. So that's two half value layers um, to get it down to the 25. So if you take the 100, you do a half value layer. So to get it down to half, so that would be 50 millirads. Take it down half again, so that's down to 25. So that's your two half value layers. So exposure time, it's considered the beam on time. So doubling the exposure time also doubles the total radiation dose of the patient. That makes sense, right? Um, should use on and off, so kind of like a pulse. So if you're watching, if the doctor's watching something, waiting for the stomach to empty, he should tap on the pedal, take it off tap it on, take it off, instead of just continually holding the beam on. Um, just using, quote unquote, a pulsed fluoro will reduce the, time, the um, direct um, beam on time, which will directly affect the radiation dose to the patient and the operator. So the cumulative manual reset timer. Okay, the purpose is um, indicate total fluoro time to assist in protection of the patient from prolonged and unnecessary exposure to radiation. So it's activated by the exposure switch. So whenever the exposure switch goes on, an audible, audible signal um, comes on also typically. And after five minutes of recorded beam on time, um, it makes it to where you have to reset it. So the idea is to make the operator aware of the total time um, that the beam is on. So you will need to record the beam um, on time for patient safety. So the limit is five minutes. So predetermined time limits may not exceed five minutes. All right. Allowable exposure rates, so on manual mode, this is the lab that we ran, so it may not exceed five rads per minute at the panel or tabletop. Does not apply during magnification procedures or recording of the fluoroscopic images where higher exposure rates are required. Remember we talked about the MA being 100 when we're actually doing spot films. So the medical physicist needs to check these um, every three years. 
Uh, here's another thing that goes along with it. Using 80 kbp, the intensity of the x-ray beam at the tabletop should not exceed for each mil MA uh, of current 2.2 rads per minute. So that sounds like a lab that we might be running. With automatic exposure rate controls, um, they shall not be operating any combination of the two potential and current, um, which results in an exposure rate in excess of 10 rads per minute um, where useful x-ray enters the patient, except during recording and boost. As we've talked about with boost, it can go up to 20 rads per minute. A med medical physicist needs to check this every year. The operator also um, must monitor the x-ray tube current and the potential at least once a week, and you need to keep records of that. So if you're assigned in fluoro, you need to make sure you keep track of that. Target to table or target to panel distance, so the TPD, the target is actually the source of where the electrons are, so um, within the tube. And there has to be 12 inches of TPD. Um, it's the regulatory minimum. So spaces have been added to the C-arms. You see those little plastic cones on there that are clear. That's a spacer to make sure that there is a minimum of 12 inches of your target to panel distance. Now, we recommend 18 inches of um, TPD. That's optimal for most fluoroscopic exams. And um, it's based on the theory that there will be a loss of low energy x-rays based on the inverse square law. So the lighting in the fluoroscopic room. So. As we've talked about, the ability to perceive fine detail is called visual acuity. The visibility of rods is poor compared to that of cones, which require daylight or photopic light. So up to 10 times greater than scotopic acuity. So um, we must have high image brightness for cone vision. The lighting in the room needs to be lowered so that the brightness of the monitor comes through. Increasing the brightness on the monitor instead of dimming the lights increases patient dose. So you want to dim the lights in the room so that you can see the brightness of the monitor to help with your, um, your vision. All right, help with your cone vision. Normal viewing distance to a monitor is 12 to 15 inches. And the eye recognition of an image is approximately 0.2 seconds. So the fluoro needs to be on for at least 0.2 seconds in order for you to tell if the image is bright enough or not. So just leaving your foot on the pedal to check to see if the image is bright enough um, it's just really not a good idea. All right, so poor image uh, receptor quality. An inadequate image receptor system will require higher MA and KVP, which increases dose of the patient. This happens due to age and malalignment of the image intensifier. And low absorption tabletops. So when a tube is under the table and made of aluminum bark-like carbon fiber, it can reduce the skin dose to the patient without shown on the image. So the aluminum equivalence of a tabletop may not be more than one millimeter at 100 kbp. Gonadal shields. It's used to protect protection of the gonads. Must be provided as long as it does not interfere with the diagnosis. So shape shields are used for men, and the shields cannot be less than 0.5 millimeters of lead equivalent. And so just so you know, with the shape contact shields for fluoro, it can reduce the dose up to 97% for men. Bucky slot um, covers. So under the table tubes, the bucky is moved and parked, you know, at the end of the table. This leaves an opening or a gap that's about two inches wide right at our gonad level. So this opening must be um, automatically covered with at least 0.25 millimeters of lead equivalent. Okay, our Three-phase generator versus our high-frequency generators. Um, it provides electrical power to the tube. The advantages over single-phase generators is near constant potential is available, higher MA is available for very short exposures, and high effective KV. Patient dose and radiographic quality, though, there's no um, improvement between the three-phase generator and the high-frequency generator in standard imaging. So. In this PowerPoint, the numbers that you see, the 0.25, the 0.5 uh, millimeters of lead, and um, all of the different filtrations is things that are going to be on your national exam, so you're probably going to be seeing them on the tests also. So make sure you memorize them. It's just straight memorization.